1938, then president of the Ford Motor Company, Edsel Ford, commissioned a one-off vehicle that he wanted to drive to Florida for his vacation in March 1939. That prototype had a 267 cubic inch V12 engine, which coincidentally was the last American vehicle to be sold with one to date. Push button doors, an externally mounted spare tire, and a hood line that was more level with the fenders than most American cars at the time. Edsel Ford's prototype was such a hit with his rich buddies down in Florida that Edsel sent a telegram back to Michigan with orders to begin production on the vehicle immediately, and thus, the Lincoln Continental was born. Three generations later, the most iconic Continental developed, the fourth generation like this 1962 Lincoln Continental Cabrio, helped synonymize Lincoln with luxury in the North American market although slowing sales leading up to the 1960s didn't help. Our spotlight is on this 2019 Lincoln Continental Reserve. But is this just the resurrection of a nameplate to bolster sales, or does it really live up to that powerful family name, the Continental? Now, if you're a Lincoln or Ford Motor Company aficionado, you probably already know this, but the Lincoln brand separated Continental back in 1956. So while the first one was developed as a Lincoln Continental, after that, they became the Continental Mark II. So something like this, though, in 1960, was remerged into the Lincoln brand, and that's because slowing luxury automotive sales in the 60s kind of forced Ford to reconsolidate it under one banner. And in fact, during the 60s, the only vehicle Lincoln produced was the Continental. Now, the model that we have here is much like what we would have seen back in the 60s. It is a four-door Cabrio, one of only the two different models that Lincoln was selling. The other one was a four-door hardtop. Eventually, the two-door version was re-added into the mix. The fourth generation also added back the rear suicide doors, allowing people to get in and out a little bit easier from the back seats and really giving it that iconic look that we know today. On top of that, this was the only four-door cabriolet sold by an American manufacturer during this time, and it was the last four-door convertible sold by a manufacturer in the United States. And also the 1967, which is a little different than this, the cabrio was the heaviest vehicle ever produced by Ford, whether it was Lincoln, Mercury, Ford, none of them have ever been heavier than the 67 cabrio. Now this uses a seven liter or 430 cubic inch V8 engine produced about 325 horsepower. Now keep in mind that was way before standardization. So 325 horsepower in today's numbers is quite a bit less. And especially compared to the 400 horsepower in the new Continental, I don't think you'd want to take either one of these on a drag strip if you're betting on this one. Now this generation also added a couple little innovations that for the most part we take for granted today. Something like the door ajar light for the driver to let you know if the rear doors were open, that was added on this vehicle. Things like vacuum operated central locking is also something that came on this car. And when Lincoln designed the 10th generation, they used inspiration from this model, such as the door handles, to give it that classic look for the newest model. Now also this generation of Lincoln Continental was the first in North America sold by a North American brand to offer a two-year or 39,000 kilometer warranty. So there's a lot going on for this generation. It's one of the reasons, one of probably thousands of reasons why it is considered to be the most iconic when it comes to the Continental brand. But that's why we're here, right? We want to know, is this beautiful piece of art just as good as the new one? Has Ford been able to really replicate the success of the original cars because they were quite spectacular. I mean, even the first generation cost almost as much as a Rolls Royce at the time. And while this one is about $84,000 Canadian, it's far to be Rolls Royce money. So we're gonna be taking a look now more at this 10th generation where we're gonna go in depth, go over everything you need to know and everything else about the vehicle. But we are so fortunate to be able to take a look at the two of these cars side by side, because really, I mean, for a lot of people, this will always be the Lincoln Continental. Can I say that it was an absolute privilege to be able to stand there and film this car with the 62 Continental? I mean, being able to line up a shot like that, being able to find the vehicle, get it filmed, have a beautiful day like it is today, 
and get everything done and have it work is so difficult, especially for somebody like me, I'm doing it all on my own. So just the fact that I was able to make it happen was in its own an amazing experience. But having a 62 Lincoln Continental to be able to film next to this, not as like a comparison, you know, obviously I'm not showing you which is better, which has more features, you know, we're just really showing it as a retrospective between how these cars have evolved. I think it's just amazing. I hope you guys appreciate it as much as I do because I think it's awesome to be able to see those two cars parked next to each other and just do something different, something special. And I, I'm really excited about it. So let's talk features. In terms of safety tech and some of the enhanced stuff that we'd like to see on these vehicles, the Continental has it. Pre-collision, automatic emergency braking, lane keep assist, blind spot information, rear cross traffic alert, and front and rear parking sensors come on this vehicle. There's also some stuff on here that we would expect to find on a vehicle at this price point. You've got LED headlights. They're automatic and they're adaptive. You also have automatic high beams as well. You have adaptive cruise control, remote start, and a park assist feature. Not that we're a big fan of that. But there are some things about the exterior of this car that I want to talk about. I like some of them, and then there's some of them that it's not that I dislike, but it's just something to note. Every time I see a Lincoln sedan, I always assume it's the Continental. The front ends look so similar, but then as I drive by, it's the MKZ, or really what should be the Zephyr. And I'm assuming they'll probably rename that, considering we've got the Nautilus, the Navigator, the Continental, and the Aviator. So we're kind of expecting to see that. But the rest of the car is more or less unique to the Continental. First of all, take a look at these mirrors on the side here. It's not just a regular mirror housing that's stuck to the door. It's kind of elegant. It's very well crafted. Power folding as well. Automatically deploys when you get into the car. Very cool stuff there. You've got the Continental badge on the side. And that's the only place you'll find it on either side of the car. It's not on the back of the vehicle. And the door handles. Those are really inspired by that 1962 that we saw. It's not actually a door handle. There's a button on the inside to open up the door. There's no door handles on the inside either. It's a button to release it. Plus, you have soft close, something that I would not expect to find on a Lincoln. Now, Ford likes to have their key entry system on the door here. That's also where you'll find the lock button too. But essentially, you just unlock the doors by pushing any of the four buttons on the car. So soft close on all four doors, power folding mirrors, a power opening rear trunk. There's a lot of good stuff going on with this vehicle. But all of that is why I'm surprised this car isn't selling better than it should. And I'm sure that's why Ford is a little disappointed as well. We've had comments, and it's really weird because it's all recently, all within the last couple weeks, couple months, that people say they want a car that's comfortable, they want it to have the power, but they don't want it to be sporty. You take a look at BMW and Mercedes and Audi, they're all very sporty. And I've been mentioning to people, well, if you want something that has the luxury and has the comfort, you can look at something like a Buick. But I think that this is also a very strong competitor if you want something that isn't over-the-top sport. Because it isn't. The exterior is not sporty at all. It's refined. It's conservative. It looks nice. It's elegant. It's not sporty. I think that could be a reason why people would be interested in it, but I'm just surprised that it is not selling. Don't know why. So let's jump around back. We'll talk about some of the design stuff there and the features, and then we'll jump on the inside. So the back end here is where things will probably get a little controversial in the comments. You might like it, you might not, and that's okay. Opinions are different. We all have our own opinion. We all have different tastes and likes. So I think it works for this vehicle. It's maybe not my favorite back end, just like it was on the Volvo S90. Maybe it'll grow on me a little bit. But the one thing I have noted is fit and finish isn't perfect on this vehicle. Some of the panels here don't quite line up. Lights don't quite line up on either side of the trunk. And that was really the focus of Lincoln's back in the 60s. Ford wanted to make sure that quality was the priority for the Lincoln Continental. Not so much here. So a couple little things like that, especially if you're paying $84,000, you really would want it to be essentially perfect. So it's going to be certainly a complaint that we talk about on our dislikes. Now, when it comes to the back end, you do have a foot swipeable trunk. Kind of makes sense. We expect to see this on a luxury vehicle. Trunk size is very good. You do have some little pouches on either side to be able to put items in a net so that they don't really fall apart but everything else is pretty straightforward you do have a small spare tire underneath the floorboard and a button to be able to close it up everything makes sense back here nothing to get too excited i think it's clean there's no displacement badges or doesn't even say continental back here you've just got the lincoln lettering in pretty big font but let's jump inside now we'll talk about the features there and then we will take it on a hopefully springtime road test 
If you follow me on Instagram at Niall Livesey, you'll know that I've been talking quite a bit about this vehicle since we've been filming it. And I've come to like it a lot more over the time that I've had it. Now, don't get me wrong, this is definitely not a 7 Series or an S-Class, both in terms of ride and comfort, and certainly price, but also the interior space. While there's a good amount of legroom in this vehicle, it is the width that makes this still a midsize or executive car. But for the most part, I'm really comfortable in here. I like this a heck of a lot more than I did the Navigator. And not that there was anything wrong with the Navigator, but as you know, I really do like sedans and wagons. So something like this just makes a whole lot more sense. Now we don't get the black label for Lincoln here. It's unfortunate. They really go to town with a lot of the interior and exterior stuff. So for example, you'd have like a true leather dashboard on some of the black label models. The dashboard and door cards are plastic and it's unfortunate because the rest of the interior is really nice. If they just added that, especially on this top reserve trim, I think it would make my experience a little bit better, but you do have the hard plastic up top. Now, I'm really happy that Ford Canada optioned this without black interior. Me personally, I like a little bit of color and these seats are their terracotta code and it uses Bridge of Weir, a Scottish leather throughout the entire seat area. And I think it's pretty comfortable. These are the 30 way perfect position seats. So you have tons of control, headrest, backrest, the lower part of the back, seat bottom, your leg bolsters left and right. It's a little over the top. Once you find your position, you'll probably be in a good spot. But I do find much like the Buick Envision that we did, the seats are a little firm. So you don't quite sink into them. You sit on top, but maybe the type of people who are looking at this car, the older demographic, they might like the seats that are a little bit firm. Now for the four seats that are the most important, the two front and the two outboard, you have heat, ventilation, and massage throughout. Excellent stuff for a mid-size luxury car. I'm quite happy that they have that. Now let's talk about some of the tech on here. We do have a color head-up display. It is very good, very large. One of the things I really like about it is when you use your turn signals, it'll actually show on the head-up display. So you shouldn't be one of those people that drive along the highway for 55 kilometers with your left turn signal on. And the only thing I find is it's not quite as bright as some of the competition. And I also find that even though the seat is as low as it can go for me, and I've put the HUD as low as possible, I still lose a little bit of the top depending on how I'm seated. You have a color multi-information display in the gauge cluster, and if you turn off the HUD, it will adjust that for that display there. So I think it's a good mix between the two. I find myself really just using the HUD, whereas a lot of times I'll have to look down on other vehicles. Like I said, the turn signals are a good feature. The center navigation screen uses SYNC 3, and while it might not be a very luxury-oriented navigation system, it still works pretty well. You have a home screen to be able to see your map, your phone information, and the current music. Navigation system has worked well. I've used it instead of the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which this car does have, but I always try to use the navigation systems. You have tri-zone automatic climate control. You do have the ability to control it from the front seat or the rear zone from the back seat. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, one of the other features with this is the 19-speaker Revel Ultima audio system. Now, Revel is part of the Harman group of companies, so it is similar in some ways to the Harman Kardon systems that we always do like on these vehicles. I find that it has good sound, maybe not the best bass and maybe not the best audio replication that I've heard from a top-end tier system, but still gets the job done. Probably worth the price to upgrade to that. Just before we move to the back seat, I want to mention quickly my extra large coffee from McDonald's here fits without problem. We usually get asked about that. You can hide away the section where you put your cup holder. And personally, I find that the interior here is more old school money. And we'll talk about that as we wrap up and go on our road test. But I find that this is more of an older design for what German luxury cars were offering. It's very simple. It's not what Ford does with their vehicles. I find that their interiors are not very inspired. This one is very functional. Everything makes sense. It's not over the top luxurious, but I do like the wood trim mixed with the chrome accents. Again, if it was a leather dashboard, I'd be a lot happier. They have a black headliner, even though things like the top portion here where your sunglasses are, eh, it feels a little cheap. But the point is that it feels like more or less what it's worth. It is an $84,000 car. It is a bit of a pill to swallow, but I do feel that it is really close to that level of luxury and it just flows with the interior here. It's not for everybody, but I do like it. Now let's jump to the back seat real quick and then we will take it on our road test. Now I'm certainly sitting in the business section of the back seat here. If you're driving in North America or any place that has a left-hand drive car, you're gonna be sitting on the right side of the vehicle, especially if it's designed for maybe an executive such as yourself. Now this has a $5,000 rear seat amenities package. I doubt that most people are gonna be buying this. In fact, I don't think anybody's really gonna be buying it. You might get a couple of them. 
So if you do find them, they're probably going to be press cars in the used market. But I got to say that it does help to enhance a little bit of the back seat space here. You do get quite a bit for it. 40, 20, 40 folding split seats in the back here. The rear armrest with an LCD screen and controls for HVAC, the radio, and the rear sunshade, as well as the moonroof. You have a dual panel moonroof, which you wouldn't get. The power seats back here allow you to tilt and recline. Plus, on this side, you can push the front seat out of the way. There's two separate sets of controls there, so if it's the first time you're sitting back here, just kind of pay attention to that. You also have four-way lumbar support back here, manual headrests with bolster support, inflatable seat belts. We've seen this on a number of Ford products so far. You also have the side sunshades built into the windows here, and B-pillar vents, something that we usually see on the German luxury cars. You have four vents up on the top area, plus coming out underneath the front seats. But as I mentioned, you do have controls here in the center. That's what makes this more of an executive car, so I can change things like my heating both the temperature and the fan speed. I can also have heat or ventilation, have my massage functions on the door like you would a Mercedes Benz. And then, like I said, you do have the ability to recline the seat. So I can push it up a little bit. Yeah, it doesn't go too far, but still gets the job done. So if you want to be upright or then you know, maybe take a little bit of a nap. And I have to say that these bolstered headrests, they're pretty nice. You can cup your head into it. So if you really do want to have a nap, maybe you're really being chauffeured around or you do have kids and you're going on a road trip, they want to be able to have a little bit of a nap. It is comfortable back here. So I do like the space back here. Again, the one thing that really still makes this a midsize car or an executive car rather than a full-size luxury car is the horizontal space on the inside here. I'm just a little bit tighter than I normally would be. And obviously I seem to have to remind people somebody of an average size would be much more comfortable back here. But now that we've talked about the backseat stuff, let's take it on our road test, talk about how this vehicle performs, and then we'll wrap up and answer the question, is this still living up to the original name of the Lincoln Continental? Last time you saw me, I was on a cheeseburger binge. I've changed my ways now. No longer am I just driving aimlessly decided to park my Lincoln Continental right in front of this place called Uzu Sushi in Actonville. Keep my poke balls instead of cheeseburgers. Right back here in the comfort of my sweet, sweet Lincoln. Everything I could want, more comfortable than my bed. All right, all right, all right. Now we've spent quite a bit of time so far going over some of the details of the Lincoln Continental, not only just on this 10th generation 2019 reserve model, but in general what the Continental was all about. And I mean, if you think about really what Edsel Ford wanted this car to be, original Continental, before it was even named that, he wanted something that was European inspired, luxurious, and different. And I think it still gets that job done today. I mean, this is a very European design. I like it. The interior here, as I mentioned, you know, it's very functional, kind of old school money when it comes to the luxury of decades past. I like it. So let's talk now about the ride because I find with a lot of cars, especially somebody like me, I'm a diehard car enthusiast. I like performance. I like sport. So often we'll kind of get a little carried away with that. We'll talk about, wow, you know, car sporty, it's performance oriented. Even when they aren't really, we're still in that mindset. So let's forget about all that. This is not a sports car. This is not meant to be sporty. So I'm not going to be doing any of that on this road test. And if you were disappointed at the beginning of the video that I wasn't going to drive the 1962 Continental, hope you're not going to be disappointed again that I'm not going to be doing any performance stuff with this car because it just... It's not the place to do it. This is not the car to talk about that because nobody's buying this Continental to do anything quick with it. Yeah, you could get the 2.7 liter twin turbo V6 engine, have less power, and probably most people will option that because 400 horsepower, 400 pound feet of torque, you're not going to be using that all the time, especially the type of clientele that are going to be looking at this vehicle. I guess mostly it's bragging rights to be able to say that you have the 3 liter. But, you know, obviously Ford's going to put that in their press model. They're not going to necessarily give away the 2.7 for journalists to drive around. But this is probably the way that I would configure the car if I were buying it. And one of the things that I've noticed is inside is quiet. 
They use active noise cancellation to help reduce road noise from the outside. The windows help to improve sound insulation, whether you're in the front or the back seat. So regular road noise is pretty limited, even if you're on the highway. I found that it is pretty quiet in here and it works really well. The ride, it's not quite as smooth as I would expect from a vehicle that has a wheelbase of 117 inches though. That's I think the one drawback is that one element could be improved. And really it shouldn't have to do with the fact that this is a front wheel drive chassis over a rear wheel drive chassis that we'd find on other German luxury cars. But still, it's the, the one thing. When you go over bumps, it has a bit of a boat-like experience. You go over it, it's soft. But I just feel more of the ride with this than I would expect from a vehicle of this size. And I think that's one thing you'll notice if you are taking it on the road. Now, I've watched some other reviews on this vehicle. And people complain, you know, like the steering is wishy-washy and it's not very quick. And, you know, the transmission, eh, blah, it's a six-speed. Again, from a performance perspective, this car is not the one to buy. But from a luxury perspective, somebody who just wants something that's smooth on the road, comfortable and quiet, doesn't matter if the steering is a little wishy-washy. Put it into sport mode, it firms up the electric steering, and then now you've got not quite the same level of heaviness that you get from a BMW, but it certainly works. If you want a little bit more oomph with the engine, put it into sport mode again. So there are ways to make this car feel a little bit more enthusiast oriented but again that isn't the point of this vehicle and that's why i'm enjoying driving it and i hope that you enjoy what we're doing with it because again i want to drive this car the way that it is meant to be driven it's designed to be driven it's not designed to be pushed to the limit heck i shouldn't even have the tachometer on my multi-information display here the way that it was set up before basically just showed you the speed simple subtle but works and I think that'd be one other complaint that I have about this. If I think back to last week, I had the Buick Envision. And one of the things that I really noted about that vehicle is just how quiet it was when you drive it. The engine, you don't really hear too much, especially as you're giving it some gas. But with this, that's like 3,000 RPM, and you can hear quite a bit of the engine. Maybe not so much on our recording equipment, but I can hear quite a bit. So again, the type of buyer who wants this vehicle trying to put myself in that mindset i want that to be quieter than it is quite a bit quieter i think that they could do some more for sound insulation just on the engine compartment be able to reduce some of that and then also too maybe the nine speed transmission that ford's been working with with general motors we've seen that in a lot of products from gm so far and ford has used that nine speed and their 10 speed transmissions in other vehicles you know, this being a few years old, I can see maybe that's why they still use the six speed. I don't really see a huge benefit of it over putting in a nine or 10 speed to help with fuel economy because they do work very well. So again, a couple little things there. If there's a facelift coming out for the Continental within the next little while, then maybe we can expect to see those things, but not much to really complain about. Again, changing the way that you look at this vehicle, not from a performance perspective, but it's something that's just a little different, kind of unique in the marketplace. After spending a week with the 2019 Continental, I do feel that this 10th generation lives up to the original concept devised by Edsel Ford in the 30s, especially in contrast to the previous two generations leading up to this one. It has the European styling to it. The ride in comfort is also there, and it's certainly unique considering how few of these end up selling in the first place. When I first picked up the car, I thought it deserved the town car nameplate instead of the Continental, but I've since changed my view on the matter. But let's talk fuel economy. We managed 10.2 liters per 100 kilometers, or 23 US miles per gallon on our 100 kilometer test loop, which was considerably higher than the 2019 Volvo S90 T8 inscription we featured, which I feel would be a direct competitor. The Volvo, however, used a plug-in hybrid system, resulting in excellent overall fuel economy. The 963 kilometers we drove during our week with the Continental averaged out to 12.8 liters per 100 kilometers, or 18 mpg, which isn't bad for a large car like this. In terms of the likes, the exterior really does score points for me. It's not sporty, but it delivers an elegant look that's becoming scarce in the automotive world. The infotainment system worked well, though not any different from what you get on any Ford car on the market today. 
The rear seat amenities are a nice plus in the midsize luxury segment, and Lincoln's approach to redesigning traditional car utilities like the door handles or button releases was a refreshing experience. Finally, the overall interior noise control was really good, giving the Continental a wistful driving experience. Now there are some things that we'd like to see improved. The issues that we had with overall fit and finish make the top of our dislike list, and while our camera might not capture them fully, some of the panel gap alignment problems, like the trunk, could be spotted from a mile away. Overall price is also high considering the Volvo S90 Hybrid comes in around the same MSRP, and the other direct competitor, the Cadillac XTS, is about $10,000 Canadian less. The engine noise could also be muted with better sound insulation, and that 6-speed transmission should be phased out for one of Ford's 9 or 10-speed units. Overall though, the 10th generation Continental has been a car I've wanted to drive for a long time now, and I'm glad I finally got the chance to do so, and do it right by looking back at Lincoln's past. We're planning to do more of these retrospective episodes of Test Drive Spotlight over the summer. In fact, we've already filmed another one before this has even been edited, so stay tuned for some really unique content you won't find anywhere else.